Wayne Highlands Chamber of Commerce and Tourism, featuring the candidates for the 9th Congressional District. My name is Rachel Thompson, and I currently serve as president of the Chamber Board, and I'd like to thank you, Congressman Griffith, for your participation in tonight's event. We appreciate Clifton Middle School for allowing us to use their facility this evening, and we would also like to thank Martha Atherholt and Gary Whitehead for serving as members of the review panel. If you have questions that you would like for Congressman Griffith to address, please submit them at the table at the rear of the room. We'd also like to thank Dr. Renoni, President of Davies Lancaster Community College, for serving as moderator again this evening. The program this evening will go as follows. First, Congressman Griffith will spend a little time discussing his platform with us, and then Dr. Renoni will facilitate the question and answer portion of the agenda. Following the Q&A, Congressman Griffith will be available for a short meet and greet. Congressman Morgan Griffith was first elected to represent the 9th Congressional District of Virginia in the U.S. House of Representatives on November 2nd, 2010, and is currently serving his fourth term. Congressman Griffith is a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over some of the most important issues facing Virginia's 9th District, including public health and federal regulations. For the 115th Congress, Griffith was named Vice Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. In addition, he serves on its subcommittee on Health and the Subcommittee on Energy as well. Prior to his election to the U.S. House of Representatives, Congressman Griffith served as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates from 1994 to 2011, where he represented the 8th District. In 2000, Congressman Griffith was elected House Majority Leader, the first Republican in Virginia history to hold that position. He is a graduate of Salem's Andrew Lewis High School and an honors graduate of Emory and Henry College. After completing studies at Washington and Lee University School of Law, he returned to Southwest Virginia where he practiced law for nearly three decades. Congressman Griffith is married to Hillary and together they have three children. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Griffith. I like questions and answers, and I'd like to get to that as quickly as we can, but I do want to say a few things, because I said that I was to talk about my platform and, and the things that I've been doing. I've been working hard for uh, Southwest Virginia, the Allegheny Highlands, and the South Side. This district is large. Uh, it has 22 counties and seven independent cities. It's larger than the state of New Jersey. And I spend a lot of time uh, in my car, riding up and down the road, when I'm not in D.C. Um, I work hard to make sure that we have an environment for business and jobs that makes sense. Nobody wants a system where there are no regulations. But nor do we want a system where the regulations are so intense and so hard for businesses to comply with that businesses have to consider whether or not they want to do business in the United States or if they want to move somewhere else. We saw this when I was first running the cap and trade bill that was up at that time. Uh, had uh, the folks at, at then Mead West Vaco, now West Rock, considering whether or not they'd be better off with their assets in Brazil than in the United States. That combined with Boilermac were two heavy sets of regulations that were being proposed uh, that would have been an end to the number one job uh, creator in the Allegheny Highlands. I was opposed to, to both of those and the part uh, on both. Cap and trade never became law. It was never passed out of the Senate, although it passed out of the House. Boiler Act uh, did become a regulation, but as you may note, as you look at the, uh, the effects of what happened with Boiler Act, I introduced a bill in my position on energy and commerce that was the House bill. That bill went over to the Senate. Like Cap and trade it was never passed uh, by the Senate. But there was enough language in there that the EPA, even under the prior administration, said, you know, maybe we've made a mistake, particularly with biomass. And so they adopted a lot of the regulations or a lot of the thoughts and, and scaled back their original proposal related to biomass in the Boiler Max regulations. And I would submit, you'd have to ask the, the company and they'd have to go back through their archives, I would submit that that opened up a lot of places to use uh, biomass, but particularly unbeknownst to me at the time, it was going to lead to uh, the ability for now West Rock, then Mead West Vaco, to have their biomass boiler, which has been a huge investment on their part. 
And any time the company starts investing in your community, it's not only good for the short run, it means that they're not planning on picking up and moving anywhere. And that's been a sea change since I first take off, took office. Now, it's not just uh, me, West Vaco, or, or West Rock. That biomass change, even though the law never passed, but the work that I did behind the scenes, working with uh, the industry and others, meant that places like uh, Vaughn Bassett didn't have to worry about what they used their leftover wood for. Have you ever thought about it? If you're, you're getting a case work piece of uh, uh, chest of drawers or something that they make, well, they have a lot of scrap pieces that they saw off of this or saw off of that. And they use that as a supplement to their fuel source um, in the heating of the plant and making sure that they have what they need. They also were worried about boiler mat. So there are a lot of things out there that I've worked on in regard to regulations. That's, I've just scratched the surface, but wanted to make it relative to this region uh, on the different things I've worked on in regard to uh, regulations. Uh, I think taxes are another big issue. And I'm very proud that we passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Tax Cuts uh, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, was designed to stimulate the economy. Well, could it be better? Yes, it could. But has the economy made significant steps forward, both with the regulatory reforms that we've made since 2016 and with uh, the reduction in taxes that businesses and families are now looking at? And I was, I was at a uh, forum similar to this a couple weeks ago, and somebody said, but I haven't seen much of my paycheck yet. And I smiled at the individual that was they asked him the particular question. And I said, well, here's what's interesting. When you were introduced, it mentioned that you had several children. If you're like my family and you take zero deductions, you won't have seen a big change yet. But when you file your taxes, we actually came close to doubling the, uh, the credit for children. So people with families are going to see a big, a big difference. And so we've seen one bump in the business world where they know things are coming. We're going to see another bump when people start filling out their taxes next year. I think those are important things that we need to look at. I'm happy to take questions, and I'll probably ought to get to that now. I will say that I've been uh, one of the leaders in the fight against uh, opioid abuse and been looking into that uh, extensively and asking questions in my role as vice chairman of the Oversight Investigations Committee. Because people may not realize it, but when you're talking about energy and commerce, you're talking about health care, you're talking about the Food and Drug Administration, you're talking about the DEA, and lots of other agencies that have to answer to our committee. And so we are, we are at the point of what we're trying to do at the federal congressional level with the opioid crisis. That being said, I'm happy to start turning it over. We'll do some questions and we'll go from there. Um, just as a reminder for the rules, uh, all questions must be submitted uh, to the review panel in the back. Uh, no questions can be asked from the floor. Uh, the candidate will have two to three minutes to answer each question. And then at the conclusion, as a reminder, Congressman Griffith will be available for a short meet and greet uh, and a photo opportunity. And, and if I talk too long, who do I look at is waving at me and say, stop, well, you'll get me. Okay. Yeah, we got a series of questions that were consistent from last evening okay. to this. So. As the, so the first question is, as the northernmost county in your district, Allegheny County has somewhat different set of needs and, and setting and setting than in the coal region. How will you, how have you and will you represent our needs when the majority of your district has different needs? Well, I don't think there's any question. I have three distinct uh, regions in the district. Uh, there's some overlap and some similarity. They're all rural <coughs> communities with small cities, just like Allegheny County and the city of Covington. Uh, but it is a fair question. And so what I do is I look at the regulations for all businesses, as I said in my opening. That doesn't include just the coal companies, but when I write my columns for the paper, coal counties have more, uh, a bigger geographic area, and we sometimes talk about them more than I talk about boiler mac and cap and trade and how that might affect uh, the paper plant. But uh, I care very much about the Allegheny Islands, just as I do about Southside and uh, Southwest. The Allegheny Highlands have some of the same needs. They have a uh, population that needs jobs. The companies have left here. In many times, many cases, the companies that have left have left, or that what they do has been moved to foreign sources. That's one of the reasons that I'm very concerned that we over-regulated 
and, and made it hard for businesses to exist in the Allegheny Highlands, just as we did in other parts of Virginia and the nation. But folks don't always realize it, when you're trying to do uh, good things, there has to be a balance. So when you're talking about not, not polluting as much, and none of us wants pollution, you have to make sure that you let people work over time to resolve those issues. So one example, I've got the bill in right now on New Source Review, it's out of subcommittee, currently pending in the full committee. Uh, new Source Review is a, is a bill that says if you're gonna, at any plant, if you're gonna start uh, something that's gonna affect the air quality, you are subject to having to change everything in your facility as opposed to just one thing. So what we've asked people to do under the way it's been interpreted by the uh, EPA is you have to swallow the whole apple whole. You have to take the whole thing in one bite. That doesn't make sense. If you're making it better, even if it's only a little piece of your factory, you should be able to make it better for that little piece as long as you're making steps in the right direction. It was interesting, one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said, well, we thought we had this thing licked and it would all be taken care of in about 20 years and now it's 40 years later and it hadn't happened. And I said, that's because you, in fact, made it hard for the companies to do it all at one time so they didn't do anything. And that's why I mentioned Vaughn Bassett earlier. They have a conveyor belt that goes out to, to about those back doors there and comes back into the system. At one time, when the, when the law was passed 30, 40 years ago, they had a piece of their paint system and lacquer system out there for the furniture. But they got rid of that and didn't need it anymore. But they were afraid to change the conveyor belt. And I asked their lawyers again before I introduced them to make sure I wasn't mistaken. They were afraid to change the conveyor belt because of the EPA's interpretation of new source review. So they run that furniture out. And it takes maybe a minute and a half to two minutes, but as anybody who's ever been in a factory knows, if you add to the time of production of a piece of furniture or any other product, you're adding to the cost and you're making it harder for them to compete. If you haven't read Factory Man, I highly recommend it to you. It's the story of how that plant decided they weren't going to cave into the Chinese and they were going to fight back. And they're still there creating jobs in the 9th District. So whether it's the Allegheny Highlands, whether it's Southside, which is not part of the coal fields either, where Galax is, making furniture, or, or whether you are in, in the Southwest, the key is to have regulations that make sense and create an environment where companies can both survive and increase jobs. Thank you. Second question is, how do you feel about arming of teachers with the example uh, recently this week of Lee County uh, court decision foremost in front of us? Okay. But we haven't had a court decision yet. What we had was the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia said that it was in violation of state law. Uh, and that's something that the courts will have to sort out. Lee County is a poor county. It is poorer than Allegheny and Covington. They don't have the resources in order to be able to afford a school resource officer. Now, we have some programs out there, but we don't have enough programs to put in, at the federal level to put school, school resource officers in every school in the nation. The state has to make a decision. And so this is actually a state decision and a local decision. The state has to make a decision for the poorer counties are they going to pay for those school resource officers? We've got counties in, in deep southwest, particularly in those coal fields. And Lee County used to be a coal county. They no longer have any open mines in the county right now. They may get some later, but they don't have one now. And we have to make a decision. They don't have the money. And one of the things people always looked at when they said, well, they've got other sources because they used to get coal severance tax. Lee County's not getting any coal severance tax now. So they made a decision they want to protect their students. How are they going to do it? In some cases, they have, they have a lot of older schools. They want to make sure that they're paying their teachers well enough to get good quality teachers. They made a choice that in a special program where they trained certain teachers who volunteered to do it, that they were going to arm their teachers. The Attorney General has now said they cannot do that. That means it goes to court because the Attorney General is the state's attorney. They have to decide, and I don't know what Lee County will decide, whether or not they want to take the matter to court or not. If they got a judge to appoint their individuals as uh, conservators of the peace, then those individuals would be in a position to carry uh, weapons concealed on the school property. Uh, it's a tough issue that each school division has to make its own decision on. You know, what Richmond City decides, what Fairfax County decides, those are different issues. For Fairfax County, this is, a, is, is easy. They've got plenty of money. They can put all kinds of resources to it. But if we want to protect our children in the rural areas, 
we need to take the measures that make sense to the, to the local school system. And do I have time to tell a great Allegheny County story? Absolutely. Okay. So I visited a lot of high schools this year under undercover, so to speak. I didn't go in secret. I told them who I was, but I just went in to say hi to the front office people for a number of the schools. And my favorite experience was when I got to Allegheny County High School. Because a student opened the door for me. I hadn't been checked in, I hadn't been cleared, and I had a little panic attack. Okay, this is how bad guys get in. Somebody's being nice, really polite, young man. And I was bringing donuts. <laughs> I walked in the door and I'm looking around, I'm thinking, all right, what do I do? I don't want somebody to think I'm an intruder. And there was this office right in front of me that had mirrored glass on it. And a deputy opened the door and stuck his head out and he says, it's all right, we know who you are, we saw the student do it. <laughs> I thought, what a great idea. Have your people right there as you walk into the school at the main entrance. Uh, have somebody keeping an eye on it. And he knew immediately what I was thinking. And he said, we, we saw it, we know who you are, you're fine, go to the office. I said, okay. So that's my fun Allegheny County story. It made me feel really good. Oh, our superintendent of the schools is here. So. Oh, good. Well, there you go. Y'all did well, thank you. Really good about the safety.